just generally about people's perceptions around sharks because that has, shark attack has a lot to do with um, how people do feel about it. Um, the Wild Oceans webinars so far have been sharing lots of facts about the surprising variety of sharks and their cousins and about their lives. And I'm here to talk about uh, interactions that humans have with sharks. Um, some of them are facts and some of them are feelings. So, um, oh, that wasn't what was supposed to happen. Here we go. So, one of my favorite research tasks has been to go around and ask people what three words come to mind when I say shark. And I'm not going to ask you because I know that that summer did last week. Um, but this is the, the result that I have heard most often. More often than anything, I hear teeth. So lots of words refer to danger and fear and death. And there have been quite a few neutral words that are about sharks and their aquatic habitat um, and ocean. Um, there have been some positive words that speak to the power and agility and majestic beauty of the shark. But I realised how much work needs to be done when somebody's response was, I hate that thing. So, what is the chance of coming face to face with those teeth? Um, what are your chances of being attacked by a shark? And this is a sensational subject and it's full of false information and um, lots of emotions. So when it comes to answer our question, it's important that we get our facts from reliable and reputable sources. And there are a few of them, like the global shark attack file and shark tracking is another one. But one of my favorites is the international shark attack file. Um, and you should Google it because it's very well researched and it's full of information that's really useful and really interesting. Um, so what numbers do we find when we look there at the um, global shark attack file? And the first thing is that we've got to bear in mind that there are 7 billion people on the planet. And on average each year, the number of shark attacks is anywhere between 70 and 100. And about five of those are fatal. So that means that shark attack is extremely rare. Many more people die because of lightning, because of toasters, because of coconuts. Um, that's a little bit silly and facetious and you actually can't really make a fair comparison between these risks and the risk of being bitten by a shark because people are exposed to them differently. So um, if we look at um, real numbers and statistics about causes of death, we use statistics from America because they keep good records. And the shark attack file gives a variety of statistics and I chose three to compare them to. And your chance of um, dying of heart disease is one in five, whereas your chance of being um, killed in a plane accident is one in 5,000. And your chance of dying because of an accident um, to do with fireworks is 340 odd thousand. And then when you look at the chance of being attacked by a shark and dying, it is one in almost four million. So again, we come away seeing that the chance of being bitten by a shark and killed by a shark is extremely rare. And they say that you should actually, the only fair comparison is to compare risks that you come across at the beach. Um, and that's the best comparison that you can do. And um, shark attack file says that you are a hundred times more likely to die of a heart attack in the surf than of a shark attack. And that really stands out for me. So we've been um, using stats from America because they've got the best data. And I want to show you a really cool 
tool on the Shark Attack file. And I'm going to try and swap now to the actual website. Here it is. And it's the interactive map. Oh, I should do that. Let's just reset. Okay, and here you can look at all of the shark attacks um, that have ever been reported over the past 120 years, or you can look at what was reported last year, and you can look by species, and I'm going to choose white shark, tiger shark, and bull shark, which is what the rest of the world calls ambesies, um, because they are the ones that are responsible for most of the more serious um, incidences. And so you, you can see that there were, there were just a few last year, but if you look at fatal, if you choose fatal, then we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, six fatal attacks last year with those three species of sharks. And none of them were in South Africa. But it's a very cool tool, so do Google it. And so I'm just going to focus now on shark attack in South Africa. And if you divide shark attack in South Africa into the last in the, la the last 100 years, if you take that time period and you divide it into two, you see very different patterns. If you look at the first 50 years from 1920 to like 1970 then you see that most of the shark attacks in South Africa occurred on the East Coast. Most of the bites happened in Brazil and Natal. If you look at the next 50 years, then you see a much bigger spread. So 1970 to last year, there were um, more shark attacks attacks along our south coast as well, and it was a lot more spread. It's, um, those first 50 years were actually quite important because they, um, they have a lot to do with how we deal with shark attack and how we perceive sharks in Brazil and Natal. Before we go any further, I want to talk about the word attack. So the International Shark Attack file will tell you that in many of the interactions between sharks and people, um, sharks didn't seem mean to hurt a person. So they made a mistake or may have been trying to figure out what, what the person was. So they, they I'd like to quote from them because they say, in most instances, probably it is a case of mistaken identity that occur under conditions of poor water visibility and a harsh physical environment with breaking surf and strong currents. The feeding shark in this habitat must make quick decisions and rapid movements to capture its traditional food items. So to call these attacks is makes sharks seem meaner than they really are. And so I prefer to use the word bites. So it's less emotional, it's more accurate. And so instead of shark attacks, I talk about shark bites. And we've been looking at numbers and at maps. And if you take one thing away from my talk, then please let it be that sharks are not mean um, man eaters. But when shark bites do occur, then whether it's a mistake or not, it's a traumatic and tragic situation. And at each one of these red dots, somebody was hurt or died. They were minding their own business, they were playing, swimming, surfing, and they lost their limbs or lost their lives. And these are real people, and it must have been, must be an awful situation to be in. So the people that what you see here are people who have been bitten by sharks in Brazil and Natal. So this is where I'm going to focus for a while. Um, and following those 
sharp attacks that you saw in news clippings from. There was an outcry and people demanded that the authorities do something. People freaked out, tourists left, um, something had to be done. And the local authorities tried a variety of different things um, and nothing really worked until they hit on shark nets. Um, these are 200 meter long nets that are about six meters deep. They sit in about 10 meter deep water, a little bit offshore. And after these nets were deployed, the problem pretty much stopped. So many people think of these nets as physical barriers that are fences and keep sharks on one side and humans safely on the other side. Um, but if you look at a bird's eye view, you can see that they're not fences. That's a 200 meter or two 200 meter nets sitting off the coast, protecting people swimming. So you can see they're not there to keep the sharks out. And this doesn't mean that they're not effective. I've heard people say that just because they're not barriers and not keeping sharks out, means that they aren't making people any safer. And I don't see it that way. I, I think it's entirely possible that um, we don't have as many shark attacks in Guazulu Natal as we used to have or would have because the nets are effective at reducing the risk to people in the water. And that's because the nets kill sharks. So they are fishing nets, they are set to catch and kill sharks. The idea is that fewer sharks means fewer shark bites. And the way I like to explain it um, is imagine you are swimming in an area with say 10 sharks, they're minding their own business, but if they come close, then there's a small chance that you might get bitten. Then imagine that we get rid of these sharks. Slowly but surely, we get rid of them. When there are just two sharks left, then the risk is surely a lot smaller than when there were 10 sharks swimming around. So reducing the number of sharks in the air potentially reduces the chances of a person being bitten. So basically they are culling sharks. Um, they are purposefully reducing the population size of sharks in KwaZulu-Natal. We as a province are intentionally and systematically reducing populations of large sharks to reduce the chances that somebody will be bitten. And I don't know how you feel about that, but it makes me more than a little uncomfortable. So now let's talk a bit about the animals that get caught in the nets. The sharks would um, divides them into two categories, the targets, the sharks and shark species that they aim to catch, and the bycatch species, which are animals that they don't mean to catch. Um, these are smaller sharks, rays, dolphins, and turtles. There's a total of 14 species that are considered targets. Um, remember we said three of these are responsible for serious incidents. Great white sharks, Zambezi sharks, and tiger sharks. And if you go to the Sharks Board's website, then they have published some of their catch statistics. And these are um, what are there for an average per year for 2013 to 2017. And you'll see they, they catch about 500 sharks a year, 400 of them die and 100 of them they tag and release. Um, then the bark catch animals, the ones that they don't mean to catch, they catch about 400 of those every year and about half of them they tag and release alive and the other half die. Um, for those species that are responsible for most of the bites, you can see the white shark, they on average they tag and release a little bit more than five um, about 17 of them die on average each year. With Zambezis, about two of them are released, whereas eight of them die. 
and on average every year they release more tiger sharks than die and it's about 35 tiger sharks and um, about 25 of them die. So altogether about 50 of the 400 shark deaths are of animals that are causing some of the sh most of the serious shark bites. So I must tell you that the Sharks Board has been working hard to minimize their impact and they used to catch and kill more than 1,500 sharks a year and they've drastically reduced the number of nets in the past two decades and they've swapped some of their nets for drum lines. Um, I think lots of people might know what drum lines are. They're basically baited hooks. And the noticeable part of the drum lines are the big red buoys, um, but the business end of the drum line is the baited hook. So this is another way to cull sharks, to reduce the number of sharks in Kwazulu Natal. And in many ways, they are better than the nets. Gill nets are indiscriminate, catch anything of a certain size. Um, whereas the baited hooks are a little more specific and they don't catch um, as many dolphins and whales. And um, there's a different set of species are caught, but they do still catch sharks. Um, and most of the 14 species of sharks and some of the bycatch species aren't really doing so well. The rate of extinction of many of these species is a big worry. So there's quite a significant number that are vulnerable. Oh, let me go back. I need to use my pointer. So this is the vulnerable category over here. It includes white sharks, sandbar sharks, gray nurse sharks, which are what we call ragged tooth sharks, smooth hammerheads and loggerhead turtles. Um, there are some species that are endangered and even critically endangered. And yet we're purposefully killing them and I'm not saying that the Sharks Board is responsible. Oh, how do I get back? Oh gosh. Let me just go back. Oh, no, don't do that. Okay, so I'm not saying that shark food is responsible for their predicament. Shark nets are just one of many of the threats that are out there, but we do need to consider if what we're doing here is the right thing. So we need to first ask ourselves a question. That do we need to protect ourselves from sharks or not? And there's a lot of debate around this question. And some people say it's no we don't need to protect ourselves it's their space people must take their own risk it is such a small risk and on the other side of the fence are people who say yes we do need to protect ourselves we need to keep people safe we need to keep our tourists safe and our tourism industry safe because um, shark attacks can be quite devastating for our tourism industry as we discovered in the 19 50s and 60s. And if your answer to this question is yes, then the next question we need to ask ourselves is, do we need to kill sharks to do this? To keep people safe, is it necessary to kill sharks? And you might be wondering how others deal with the issue and here are some of the other ideas and I go around in a clockwise direction and I start at the top left and here you see a structure called the shark safe barrier okay it looks like kelp and is a visual deterrent to sharks and it also has magnets in it which um, deter sharks in a similar way to electricity and that is what the next picture is with the guy on the surfboard 
um, he's got a pod, a personal protection device, and he and um, Sandelia talked about how sharks can sense electricity, and we can use that sense to um, keep sharks away and out of our space. Um, and it's an option that Sharks Board is busy working on. It, it seems to work quite well as a personal protection device, but in terms of protecting a whole beach is a different story and is a whole lot harder, but they are busy investigating this at the moment. Um, the next one, the eyes on the bottom of the um, surfboard, you might think that it's quite a silly thing to to do, but it's actually a trick that's used by nature. Think of butterflies, think of butterfly fish. And the aim here is to trick sharks into thinking that they have been spotted and have lost the element of surprise, and so they are less likely to ambush. Then we've got the shark spotters, which is what you see in the bottom. Um, in Cape Town, very nice system where people sit on the top of the or higher up on the dunes and look down over the beach and there they can see white sharks sometimes and they will warn people and people come out of the water. And then lastly is the little spray can on the bottom left and someone discovered that sharks don't like the smell of dead sharks and they managed to put that smell into a can and um, if you catch it right, there are videos online that you can see sharks reacting quite strongly to the release of the smell. Now, I wish I could tell you that one of these was the perfect solution in KZN, but unfortunately, it's not that simple. In KZN, we have particularly difficult conditions. It's difficult to keep anything in place in the surf zone because we've got big waves and we've got shifting sediments and sands. Nothing stays still there. And it's also difficult to detect sharks because we don't have nice clear water in KZN. And also in KZN, Zambezi and tiger sharks are more of an issue and they tend to swim low down in the water column so they aren't as visible from about so detecting sharks using visual cues is actually very difficult. But I don't think we should give up trying. I think we must keep having ideas and we must test them. And technology is moving so fast that one of these days there's going to be something that that works nicely in KZN. So there's no obvious solution. And if we don't have any protection, it's entirely possible that somebody could um, could be bitten by a shark and that isn't something that we want to happen and because no one person has the solution because there's so much debate I've been talking to and listening to various decision-making stakeholders to understand the various perspectives when it comes to using shark nets to protect bathers um, I'm planning to collect and put all a whole lot of information together about alternative strategies and work with the stakeholders to prioritize different alternatives and see what is worth testing in KZN. Um, some of my other research and where I started was actually with dolphin research and my master's project was looking at testing the effects of pingers which are acoustic warning devices Bing! put them into nets and we wanted to test the effect on dolphins behavior. It's rare and endangered species of humpback dolphin. We wanted to find a way to keep them out of the nets. Um, so we were trying the pingers, but they didn't work to warn the dolphins and they carried on getting caught. So the next thing that we tried was to identify the nets that catch more dolphins than others and that worked quite well. The Sharks Board decided to swap those nets with baited hooks and we have significantly reduced the number of dolphins, humpback dolphins that die in the shark nets. Um, 
but it doesn't help sharks. So that's where, why you found me where I am today, looking at sharks as well, trying to figure out how we can work a solution that is good for all the species that use the water for, for dolphins, for sharks and for people too. Um, and you can see a little bit more about that work um, at our website, which is dolphins.org.za. And there you can also see our webcam. Um, we spot dolphins via the webcam. Unfortunately, it's not working ideally at the moment, but we have our um, Neurospec team. They are looking into it, trying to figure out why it's not transmitting properly at the moment. So if it's not working when you go there soon, please do try again in a little while because it should be working again soon. You can also check out our Facebook page. And enough about me, I want to hear a bit about you. And I'd like to know what makes you feel connected to sharks? What about them appeals to you? And what connections do you see between people and sharks? What, what should we be telling other people who don't already feel that connection? What can we tell them that they could end up with a similar appreciation of these weird but wonderful creatures? And then, we got to chat about what can you do and what can the youth do. And we need more people in KZN and in South Africa to know that there's much more to sharks than just their teeth. And we need them to be less afraid of sharks so that they don't demand protection from sharks at all costs. And there is evidence that the more people know about sharks, the better their attitude to sharks is and the more likely they are to conserve sharks. So I think the most important thing that you can do is to share what you know about sharks and encourage people to be rational and think logically because shark attack is so real. And to encourage people to tolerate sharks and be kinder to them because we need them. We need sharks in our marine ecosystems to have healthy ecosystems so that we can have healthy human populations. And I think that we need to, and I, or I believe that the Sharks Board is trying hard and that we should find ways to support them in their quest to be more environmentally friendly. And the other thing I think you can do is to share your ideas. So we've got some social media platforms, Safe for Sharks KZN. You can find us on Facebook, um, on Instagram, on Twitter, using that um, hashtag, I suppose. I don't know. But, um, and if you could drop us a line with your ideas there, um, we can connect up and, and have a conversation about it. So in other words, my advice to everybody is to keep calm and love sharks. And look after your heart, because it's more likely to attack you in the surf than a shark is. And I just want to say thanks to you, to all the sponsors of my project, and to Wild Oceans for the opportunity to chat with you and for all of the wonderful things that they are doing in this space to look after sharks and their relatives. And I uh, will leave you with that so that if you want to jot down our details then you can know how to find us. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And luckily, we have some time for questions. Um, so I'm going to ask if you could stop sharing your screen so we can see your lovely face. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, I'm sure that you might have received 
uh, some of the questions um, sent through from the chat. Um, you can choose whichever, um, whichever question you would like that you've received and maybe answer one or two. So maybe just say the, the, the uh, state what the question is and if you could give your answers, that would be great. Okay, well, I have a question here. What types of sharks die most in the net? And off the top of my head, the, I'm pretty sure that's dusky sharks. Mm, yeah, I can, I can look it up quickly. Um, but I don't have my computer here. <laughs> but um, let me just look. Now I'm sure it's dusky sharks. I will just go with that. Um, oh, what's happening with the great whites in False Bay? Have they returned? What's the percentage of great whites in Guazulu Natal? Mm, now that is not my uh, my expertise. I don't actually have very much to do with. Great White and False Bay. I know that at the beginning of the year, some people had seen one or two, but I don't think they're back in their normal numbers. Um, I think they are still quite scarce, but they're not, not at zero anymore. And I don't know the answer to what proportion of them occur in KZN. I do know that they travel far and wide, and it's entirely likely that we see the same sets of individuals in, in all those, in KZN as well as in False Bay. Somebody else might be better equipped to answer that question than me. Um, any other questions? Um, if the rest of the world have figured out how to live in harmony with sharks, why can't KZN? That's a good question. I'm not 100% sure that everybody else has. They do kill sharks, cull sharks in Australia, in the Union, um, they have issues in Brazil. They try to catch and release the sharks and they have a much better survival rate than we do in KZN. Like 80% of the sharks survive, um, whereas here 80% of the sharks die. Um, but also we seem to be a hotspot for fatalities, so that might be another reason that we don't um, get on with them so well. But I think one of the big things is that we, it's almost become part of our culture in KZN. We have shark nets and we think that if we didn't have shark nets, we would be dying like a at a crazy rate. I've, I've not done like sound research yet, but in a small pilot survey that I did of people's perceptions of well, how often they think we would be bitten by sharks if there were no nets. We have more people thinking that we'd we'll be bitten on a daily and monthly rate than on an annual rate. So I think people really just don't understand how rare it is. So Maybe that's my answer, but in KZN especially, we have a culture of fear of sharks. We need to get over that. And Shannon, I see a, also another interesting question that came through, which is a more personal one that you could answer. What do you find most fascinating about sharks? Sure. <laughs> Uh, it would be a toss up between the fact that they have been on this planet for so long. I cannot imagine that they've been for millions and millions and millions of years. I find that absolutely fascinating. And I cannot imagine that we could do something to make them go extinct now. So I think we really have to do something that... Um, doesn't let that happen. But also just the wild variety of species. So when I solve this particular problem, then I'm gonna go and work on these cute little pajama sharks and the cat sharks, because I think they're so cute. 
And then um, just a, one last question before we, um, we finish off. I see one question has come through. Uh, Shannon, do you think that the media has played quite a big role in maybe, I can't find another word, in misrepresenting um, uh, information about what everyone calls shark attacks? Do you think the media, maybe, maybe we need to collaborate with the media to help them understand um, sharks and shark behavior and maybe position it not to, you know, not as shark attacks as you said, but, um, but rather educating them. Do you feel that sometimes the media, you know, gets it wrong and they're kind of responsible for the fear out there? Without any doubt, they do sensationalize what happens there. But somebody, one of the people that I interviewed in my stakeholder um, work, said a really thought-provoking thing. And that was, he thinks it's because of the way we respond to the media, that the media does that. So if we didn't consume media that said those sorts of things, then the media might not be saying those sorts of things. But there is no doubt that movies that we see do um, cause an exaggerated fear because it's really hard to draw the line um, with what is what is um, like potentially like feasible and what isn't. And yes, we do need to talk to our media and start getting them to report correctly. 